only two chapters long, but there's a lot of stuff in it. This chapter is actually pretty short, our articulation. Um, we might even finish it tonight, but uh, don't underestimate it because there's a lot of vocabulary words in this chapter. And a lot of the vocabulary words start with the letter S. This is like the chapter of S words. I think there's like 12 S words in this chapter. Um, so yeah, it gets, it gets a little intense. But the, the next chapter is very uh, physiology intense. So we're kind of picking up the physiology uh, parts of this class. So just let me explain some differences between lab and lecture at this point. Because we there's a chapter in your textbook on bones. And we skipped right over it, right? Because we're doing bones in lab. Right, we're, we're learning all of the parts of the bone and lab. So in here, I'm not going to give you a picture of the humerus and ask you, you know, what's this part of the humerus on a, on a two-dimensional image? Because you're going to identify parts of the humerus over in lab. So I try to, actually all of the instructors here at Hartford, we, that's, that's kind of how we do things. We, we'll test the what is this type of stuff over in lab, and then in here, there's enough other stuff for us to talk about. So that's why we skipped over that. And we'll be doing the same thing with muscles. We'll be doing the muscles in lab, but we won't go through and name all of the muscles and everything in here. So that's how lab and lecture differ just a little bit. So last night in lab, we, were, we did have a chance to look at at least one joint. We looked at the intervertebral joints. We kind of looked at the shoulder joint a little bit. Um, in this chapter, though, there are some specific joints that we'll kind of highlight. Um, but first, we need to understand joints in general and, and what they do. So functions of our joints. Uh, obviously, they're there for movement, right? But they also provide stability because there are some joints that don't move at all, right? Think about the joints of our skull, those sutures, right? They're completely immovable, but they're very, very stable, right? Whereas something like our shoulder, which is the most movable joint in the body, is also the least stable joint. So in the world of articulations, in the world of joints, there's a trade-off between movability and stability. The more movable something is, the less stable it is, right? The more fixed something is, the more stable it is, right? So there's this, this inverse relationship between movability and um, stability. So. Um, our joints also allow our long bones to grow. Remember that epiphyseal plate? That's a joint, <laughs> right? So this is another function of joints, right? It allows our long bones to grow lengthwise at that epiphyseal plate, which eventually becomes the epiphyseal line, right? That's the little high bone. So it's a temporary joint. Let's talk about how joints are classified. So we have um, articulation. Our joints can be structured um, by how they move. Um, in other words, by their function. Right? By how they move. They can be something called a synarthrosis. Remember I told you there's lots of S words. Here's one. Synarthrosis. This is no movement. That prefix S-Y-N usually means without. This is no movement. We also have amphiarthrotic joints. Amphiarthrotic joints are kind of sort of movable, so semi-movable or slightly movable. And then we have diarthrotic joints. These are freely movable joints. So the joints that you probably thought of when I said, oh, we're going to learn about joints. You probably thought of diarthrotic joints. You probably thought of your hips, your knees, your elbows, your shoulders, right? So those are diarthrotic joints. To give you an example of an amphiarthrotic joint, um, where your pelvic bones come together in the front and you might remember like what the, the skeletal model in lab looks like. There's a little cartilage pad right in the front of those bones. And when you sit, those bones aren't rigid. They kind of compress and relax a little bit. And that cartilage pad in there allows them to expand. Your rib cage is not completely fixed. Yes, it's bones attached to cartilage, 
But as you breathe, your rib cage expands, right? It elevates and it, and it lifts up, right? And so that's that slightly movable piece that makes some of those joints amphiarthrotic, right? Whereas freely movable would be the arms and legs, right? And then the synarthrosis, an example of that would be like your, the sutures in your skull. So we're gonna go through and look at, at all different uh, types here. So this is just how we classify joints by function. But we can also classify joints by structure and how they're put together. And you'll, you'll see some patterns here. So some of our joints are what we call fibrous joints. Fibrous joints are held together by uh, ligaments, really tight, tight pieces of connective tissue. Hold these pieces together. I'm just going to write CT, connective tissue there. It's usually dense regular, but not always. We also have cartilaginous joints. These are joints that have lots of cartilage. So the examples that I gave of that pubic, um, that pubic joint and then the joints at the rib cage, those are all cartilaginous joints. There's cartilage associated with those. So usually a cartilage pad. associated with them. And then we have something called synovial joints. I'm actually going to put this over here. Our synovial joints, these uh, are surrounded by a synovial cavity and have a synovial membrane. Do you remember that term, synovial membrane? When we were doing membranes back in, what was it, chapter 3? Right, you have four types of membranes in your body, mucous membranes lining the opening, cutaneous membranes, your skin, right? You have the serous membranes like the pleura and the pericardium, the peritoneum, and then you have synovial membranes. Here's where they are. They're surrounding our uh, synovial joints. So they, they're, they also have something called a synovial cavity. Or a joint cavity. And so... Um, we'll look at we'll look at all of these. For, we'll start with cartilaginous and fibrous joints first, and kind of go through them. I usually delete these slides out. I forgot to do that. There we go. All right. So fibrous joints. Fibrous joints are um, usually synarthrotic joints. They're held together by connective tissue. An example would be a suture. Right. A suture is synarthrotic. A suture is in the skull, right? A suture is an immovable joint in our skull. It's where our skull bones or cranial bones fuse together. There's also something called a gomphosis. A gomphosis is another synarthrotic joint, so it's a joint without movement. And remember how I told you sometimes I'll, I'll do a motion or I'll say something in a certain way to help me remember it? Whenever I say the word gomphosis in my head, I'm thinking of saying it like this, gomphosis, like old man with no teeth. Because a gomphosis is your teeth joint. It's the joint between your mandible and maxilla, maxilla and your actual teeth. So gomphosis, remember it that way, with your teeth. Another example of a fibrous joint, go over here, is something called a syn, here's another S word, desmosis. So remember I told you, you gotta, you gotta master the S words in this chapter. We have a synarthrosis, we have a suture, we have a syn desmosis, and we have synovial. Already, there's a few more. A syn desmosis, this is a um, slightly movable, So it's an amphiarthrotic joint. It's held together. Um, an example here would be the distal um, tibia and fibula joint, right at your ankle. So there's a lot of connective tissue wrapped around there. It allows for a little bit of movement, a little bit of compression as you put weight into your foot. It, it swiggles around just a little bit. 
Here's the suture, right? Immovable, very stable. Remember that relationship between movability and stability. The less movable it is, the more stable it is. Sutures are our most stable joint. That's why we have them in our skull. Right? Protects the brain, etc. Syndesmosis, uh, the joints between the tibia and fibula, like I mentioned. Also the joints between the radius and the ulna, right? They, they don't really move around each other. Right, we saw that last night when we were putting together your upper arm. They're kind of like wrapped around and glued together, if you will, with ligaments, right? But if you press down on your wrist, right, you're doing a handstand or something like that, they will kind of space out a little bit. There's a little bit of stretch there. They're not completely locked in place like your sutures, right? And so those syndesmoses are held together by thick sheets of connective tissue, right? Um, did I skip bumphosis accidentally? Oh. All right, maybe I did. Yep, there it is. Gonphosis. Sorry if I skipped that. Uh, gonphosis are our teeth joints, and there's actually little ligaments in there holding your teeth in, right? As you get older, right, generally if you have tooth decay on the outside of your teeth from maybe not taking care of your teeth or maybe, you know, gingivitis or whatever, but those ligaments, just like all of your connective tissue all over your body is starting to fail, right, wrinkles and things like that, these start failing also, which is why you're more likely to lose your teeth as you get older. Those periodontal ligaments just kind of loosen up. This is also how children lose their teeth. Those periodontal ligaments just kind of pull away, right, as that the adult tooth is coming in behind. It loosens up those ligaments, and then they got a wiggly tooth. You'll get all into to teeth uh, and dentition in the digestive system next semester, but that's coming. They, asked, they actually mentioned the periodontal ligament in Finding Nemo. Right? You know, there's like the dentist, right? And so he's, he's like drilling something and then that stork guy or the pelican guy comes in and he's like, oh yeah, you know, Nemo, this da 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 And then he's, he's talking anyways. He says, has he loosened the periodontal ligament yet? And I'm like, yay, A and P, because he's doing a reach now. So, mm -hmm. the dentist guy. Anyways, P. Sherman, right? P. Sherman. <laughs> All right, uh, let's talk about some cartilaginous joints now. So for cartilaginous joints, we have something called a synchondrosis. Uh, I'm going to switch colors just so that it doesn't all blend together up here, but, well, if I can. But not because it's any more or less important. So synchondrosis. A synchondrosis. This is our epiphyseal plate. It's called a synchondrosis. And then we also have something called a symphysis. Two more S words for you, I told you. A symphysis is a, a fibrocartilage pad. So a synchondrosis is the joint at your epiphyseal plate, right, between the diaphysis and the epiphysis of the long bones. A symphysis has a fibrocartilage pad. So examples of a symphysis would be your intervertebral discs, right? Your intervertebral joints are a symphysis. The joint at the front of your pubic bone, there's that little pad there, it's called the pubic symphysis. have a, they allow for very little motion. So these are syn, oh, the, the synchondrosis, this is a synarthrotic joint. So there's no motion here. And this is amphiarthrotic. So this allows for a little bit of motion. This is um, our epiphyseal plates. This is also the sternocostal and costochondral joint. So that joint between your first rib and, and your sternum, that's called a synchondrosis as well. Fused together tightly. So all of your ribs are kind of amphiarthrotic and, and flexible as you breathe, except this very first one. That one's kind of locking everything in place. Everything else just kind of pivots around that. 
And then, of course, your epiphyseal plates. Showing you that. Uh, whoops, wrong way. There we go. Symphysis, this is amphiarthrotic fibrocartilage pad, intervertebral joints, and pubic symphysis are the examples here. Next week in lab, we'll do lower extremities, and so you'll get to see the hip bones, and, and we'll look at that um, joint in particular as well. But yeah, so if you can't recall what Seymour looks like, there's a big piece of cartilage right in, in the front of the pubic bones. Yep, it's called the pubic symphysis. <clears throat> so, there are uh, fractures that can occur at the epiphyseal plate. Has any, did anyone in here have one of those? Maybe if you were, broke a bone when you were younger. So this is where that growth plate actually breaks instead of breaking on the diaphysis and breaking the shaft. So an epiphyseal plate fracture could affect the um, overall growth and lengthening of the bone. So usually this, this happens, you know, uh, in some type of uh, accident like gymna gymnastics or at a playground or something like that. Uh, but it could affect the growth of that limb. So you might, and depending on what age, right, and, and how bad the damage is, um, it might, might mean that that limb is not getting any longer. One of my friend's um, husbands, he didn't have an epiphyseal plate fracture. He had a natural bone disease that took over just one bone in his body, uh, took over his femur. And, but it happened when he was really little. And uh, so it's, this is kind of cool but creepy at the same time. He actually has a cadaver femur. And, and he has to go and, and get it replaced like every 10 years or so because, you know, it, it's, a, it's bone tissue from a dead person. And, and so it just doesn't metabolize the way like non-dead um, bone tissue does. And so he just had his, his like, 10 year surgery, you know, like a, a year or two ago. But uh, but yeah, he had to have he had to have different ones every year as he was growing throughout his teenage years because as he was he was growing his uh, his other leg wasn't growing and and so he would have to have those kind of bone replacements. It's kind of crazy. Um, back to the epiphyseal plate uh, fractures though. Pain, swelling, redness, obviously as with any broken bone. And then depending on the severity, obviously immobilization, that's what they do with any bone breaks. And uh, there's usually some type of physical therapy type rehab that has to go in, maybe even some surgery. So um, let's start moving into our synovial joints now. So what we've talked about already is all of the other types of joints other than the freely movable joints. So synovial joints are our diarthrotic joints. These are the freely movable jointy joints that you probably thought about when I said we're learning about joints tonight. So they all have an articular capsule, which is a double layered um, structure, and a synovial cavity. So this cavity is kind of like its own separate space surrounding where these bones meet up. There's lots of things in there. Remember, with increased mobility comes decreased stability. So there's extra ingredients in there to make it more stable. So let's talk about the articular capsule. The articular capsule itself has an inner synovial membrane and an outer fibrous layer. So I'm not going to be able to fit all of this in this little space over here. So I'm going to erase this. Does anyone want to snap it before I erase it if you want it? I don't know. I must go twice. You don't have to, but I know a lot of people like it. Okay. So we're going to make a new one with synovial joints, and we'll draw some too. You could, if you're drawing along, just add on to your little branch of that same graphic organizer, but I'm not going to be able to fit it up there. So they all have an articular capsule. The inner layer is the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid. The outer layer of this capsule is very thick and fibrous, right? And it basically serves to, in, to isolate this structure, right? It's protect it and separate it from anything else, any other muscles, nerves, whatever. It isolates it. So 
The synovial fluid, which is secreted from the synovial membrane, is there for lubrication, right, reduced friction. <coughs> it's also there to, to help transport nutrients um, and wastes to the joint tissues, right, like any ligaments, the cartilage, etc. So it kind of acts like a like a moat, if you will, right? It surrounds the whole joint cavity. It takes stuff from the blood, gives it to the cartilage, the ligaments, all the bone cells that are in that area, takes the waste products from all of those structures, and then puts it in the blood. So blood doesn't actually get into this articular capsule. It's like a blood-free bubble. Right? And the synovial fluid pulls the good stuff from the blood that those structures need and puts the waste products into the blood. It serves as this little medium. It's also there for shock absorption. Right? It acts like a little bubble wrap around the whole joint cavity. Keeping it nice and fluid filled will help, keep, uh, help absorb any shock um, you know, from any stress, shock absorption. There's also articular cartilage. So we have a capsule. We have articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is made of hyaline cartilage. Right? It's there to protect the ends of the bones. It's avascular. All cartilage is avascular. There's no blood supply going to any cartilage. It's all avascular. There's also some adipose tissue in there, some extra fat. There's some nerve endings in there. And um, there's blood vessels that surround the area to make sure that it, it, it has nutrients. So this is a general synovial joint. There's, this has no extra structures on it. but any synovial joint, any movable joint in your body has these things. This little joint right there, yep, has that. This little joint right there, yep, it has that. This joint right here, yep, it has that. Anything that moves has this stuff, right? It has all of those things that we just did. Cartilage, capsule, fluid. But some of our joints have other things, right? So those, these things are all great and good, right? So for a little wimpy joint like our finger joints, that's all they need. Right? But for something like our shoulder, we need, we need some more things in there to help protect and support it because it's really movable. Right? Something like our hip, something like our knee, right? there's other things in there. So there's some supporting actors. Right? There's some supporting things in there doing this. One is ligaments. So we're going to call this supporting structures. Right? They're not the star of the show, and they're not necessarily in every synovial joint but they're there if they need to be there. One is a ligament. So students like to mix up ligaments and tendons. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. This is how I remember that. Muscle is meat, right? When you eat meat, you're eating muscle. And you like your meat tender, right? You don't want tough meat. So I think of a tendon, and I think of tender meat, tender muscle, right? Whereas a ligament could sound like a ligament, and my, bone, my legs are made of bones. I know that's, a, that's another stretch, but whatever works for you, right, to help you keep them straight. A ligament is connecting bone to bone, a tendon is connecting muscle to bone. So <coughs> this is dense, regular connective tissue, right? That's what ligaments are made of, D-R-C-T, right? And it's there to support your bones, connecting one bone to another bone. Tendons are there also, connecting the muscles of that area to the bone. Tendons are also made of dense regular connective tissue. And we'll talk about muscle tone 
Um, your book throws muscle tone in with this chapter, but we'll talk about muscle tone when we do muscles in the next chapter. There's, an, there's enough for that. Other things that are associated with synovial joints, something called bursa. So, so far, I'm going to go back, hopefully you'll let me, there we go. So far, we have this joint capsule, we got a membrane, we got some fluid in there. Now we're going to start adding all of these ligaments and tendons. Think of all these like wires in there, right? All of these strings going in different directions. Well, this is a movable joint. So what's going to happen to these strings, tendons and ligaments, as our joint starts moving? They're going to, stretch they're going to get stretched. They might rub against each other. What would happen if the strings of tendons and ligaments rubbed against each other? Right? Think of like a violinist with their bow, like what happens at the end of their little solo performance, that bow is all stringed out, right? So bursa are there to protect those moving structures. Bursa wrap around the tendons, wrap around the ligaments to prevent that type of friction. So you'll find bursa anywhere where there's ligaments crossing over each other, or tendons crossing over each other, or tendons crossing over ligaments, or ligaments crossing over tendons. Follow me? That's where they would be. They're, they're there to prevent this from happening. It's a little piece of bubble wrap right in there. It's like sticking a balloon in between them so that friction can't occur. So what happens during bursitis? So bursitis is now you have the structure, which is normally this big, and it's this big, right? And so that could be because of some type of infection, or it could be it's compensating because something else is damaged, right? And anytime you have swelling, you're going to have pain. Because that bursitis is what they want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So maybe your ligaments didn't fuse together after they broke or something, you know, something wasn't quite right and so your bursa kind of got a little bigger to compensate for that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Just call me Dr. Jamie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just always curious. I'm like, why yeah. is that? Actually, when I, um, this was years and years and years ago, I was, uh, do you remember that Body Worlds exhibit? That yeah. It's like all like yes. the cadaver bodies, and it circulates to all these different science centers. But it was at the, the science center at, um, in Baltimore. I mean, this was when I was in college. So this was 15 years ago I was there. Um, but I was there, and my sister, who's considerably younger than me, she was either in high school or, oh, yeah, she was, at, she was in high school. You know what? I was in college. I was, I was a teacher. I was teaching middle school at the time. Anyways, we're going through, and I'm, like, teaching her all this stuff because I knew about the human body because I took AMP. And this, I noticed this group of people were like following us around, like <laughs> listening to me as I was like, oh, and here you can see this on this, and you can see this on this. And, and I look, and, and the people were finally like, oh, sorry, we're listening to you. We wanted to follow the doctor around. And I was like, actually, I'm a teacher. <laughs> but anyways, uh, OK, so that's my little, I'm not really a doctor story. Uh, OK, bursa, I think of them as bubble wrap. Uh, or you can think of them as little balloons, right? Any, any B letter association might help you remember that word. Bubble wrap or a balloon in between preventing the rubbing of tendons and ligaments. Or even maybe a ligament against the bone. Go ahead, Tim. So question, you have um, bursa as SAE at the end, and on your PowerPoint it has... It doesn't matter. Gotcha, okay, let's yeah. just check in. Yeah, so sometimes, good question. Um, so sometimes the book will use an, an American spelling, and I'll use a Latin, or the book will okay. use Latin, and I'll use American. That that Latin E that's on some, some things is movable. You could okay. have it or not have gotcha. it, it's fine. Yeah, it won't make this... It won't be a 0.25 I was on, say, on a spelling. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I'll wrap from venting friction. Okay, last little piece is a tendon sheath. So, a tendon sheath is just uh, a longer bursa surrounding longer areas. Conscious of my Latin E now, I'm like, oh, I do that a lot. It's just training my brain. I've just done it for so long. So again, it's all it's all just about protecting all of those moving parts. The more mobility you have, the less stability you have. So the more structures you need in there to support it. So look at the shoulder, for example. So here would be that a tendon sheath, a really long bursa, wrapping down and around 
one of our, our longer um, tendons, right? A tendon of this is like the triceps or biceps, right? Whereas a normal bursa would just be maybe right underneath one of the little ligaments there holding, holding it together. So, ooh, there you go. Just in case you want to see it related, I did that on purpose. All right, uh, bursitis. Uh, this is when those, um, anytime you have an itis, I-T-I-S, right, that's an inflammation. So this is an inflammation of the bursa. Um, it could be because of some type of overcompensation, some type of injury. It can also be caused by an inflammatory disease, maybe like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, people tend to get it a lot in all of these highly movable, highly stretched joints like shoulders, hips, knees. Um, rest is always the best thing, which is not always possible, especially if it's in a joint like your ankle. What are you supposed to do? Not walk. Um, so it'll feel tender, swollen, maybe even be warm because the inflammation causes more blood flow to the area and blood is warm, so that's why you might get some heat associated with that. Some treatment, obviously rest, elevation, compression, all of the typical uh, injury uh, diet, uh, things to do when you are uh, in pain like that, anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. Things like that. It could be difficult to cure, um, especially if they can't pinpoint a cause, which might be why you're living with that for quite some time. It comes through. Yeah, yeah, especially with crappy weather like we've been having, right? Yeah. Um, arthritis is another kind of disease of our joint. So in arthritis, this is where the joint obviously swells, and different parts of the joint could be swollen. Like, um, so an example here: osteoarthritis. There's three main types of arthritis in um, in our world. And this is not to be confused with osteoporosis, right? Osteoporosis is thinning of bones because of increased osteoclast activity. Osteoarthritis um, is caused by wear and tear, right? A lot of 20 year olds have osteoarthritis, especially if you're like an uber athlete that doesn't take care of your body. Um, like maybe you don't stretch properly or, or whatever, right? Don't wear the right types of shoes or whatever when you're running. So osteoarthritis is wear and tear. This happens uh, as you get older, it's naturally going to happen, right? Because all of that connective tissue, all of that cartilage that's avascular, it's not getting the blood and the nutrients like it used to because your metabolism slows down. And so this is going to cause that pain and stiffness um, that we get. It also leads to loss of mobility, right? Osteoarthritis, because your joints hurt, you're less likely to move. And the less you move, the more motion, uh, range of motion, you're, or the less range of motion you're going to have. And, then we also saw the effects of that on bone, right? The less movement you have, the more your bones are going to kind of disintegrate away. Does osteoarthritis lead to rheumatoid arthritis? No, so they're actually, none of them are related. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. This is where your body just all of a sudden, for some unknown reason says, I don't like my joints, <laughs> right? And it starts attacking the joints, right? Normally your body's immune system attacks foreign invaders, bacteria, viruses, things that don't belong. But in rheumatoid arthritis, your body is attacking your joint cavities. Um, and so you have to get on, uh, like, uh, not only just anti-inflammatory, but sometimes you also need some type of immunotherapy to help control rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis can happen in five-year-olds, right? It's not a wear and tear thing. It's just, it's that your immune, your immune system decides, I don't like any of my joints, and starts, and it can attack your fingers or your knees or your fingers and your knees, right? It can attack any of your joints. Um, gout arthritis is actually a metabolic condition. So gout is a condition that develops when your body's unable to process uric acid. And so uric acid is a natural byproduct of, of metabolism and digestion. And it's usually recycled. But in gout, uric acid forms crystals. And these crystals tend to move down in your lymphatic system with gravity. So they, they, those crystals tend to accumulate in your ankles and in your toes, right? And so it causes standing and, and any pressure in your ankles and toes to be very uncomfortable, right? And so, or, and or swollen. So people with gouty arthritis, it's a metabolic condition. It can be activated by eating um, things in your diet. So different people are gonna have different triggers, but um, that's what gout is. It generally causes a swelling and lots and lots of pain. Um, and, and that also comes in cycles. It'll kind of flare up and then go away, so. That's our first. Um, we did bursitis already. All right, let's talk about the other way our joints are classified. So they can be structured 
or rather classified by how they move. So we have non-axial joints. So non-axial joint, that's just one with no, no movement, right? There's, there's no, no movement uh, or, or movement in one, one direction. A uniaxial joint is where it's just moving in one axis. A biaxial joint will allow motion in two axes. So once you see examples of this, it'll make more sense. And a triaxial would allow in all three. So when you think about the planes of space, right, kind of like the planes of your body, you have this like right, left, right, you have front, back, right, and then you have up and down. And so that's what these monaxial, uniaxial, biaxial, triaxial are referring to. What, how many planes of space it, can this joint move through? So um, let's talk about your elbow joint at first. We're going to go through and talk about specific joints here. So your elbow joint only allows one, one direction. You can't bend your elbow backwards, right? You can't bend it to the side. It can only do this, right? So this is a uniaxial joint. It moves in this kind of perpendicular fashion, perpendicular to its axis. That's how it moves. Whereas your metacarpal joints, right? Your, your metacarpal joints, your hand joints, these are biaxial. You can actually move them this way, right? And this way. They can, they can contract this way and that way. So two, two axes. Um, a triaxial joint would be like your shoulder, right? So this can go up and down, front and back, right? And um, I do side to side, kind of out, right? So it can move in, in all three planes of space, which also means, again, the more movable it is, the less stable it is. Because your shoulder can move in all three planes of space, your shoulder is also the least stable joint in your body because of that. Right? Kind of go back and forth, in and out, and then across and in. Right? The movements that take place at your joints have to deal with how those articulating surfaces, how your bones are actually formed, and how they're put together, right? how they're held together. So again, all of this is all dealing with synovial joints, right? We're kind of done talking about the anterior arthrotic and the center arthrotic joints. This is all synovial joints here. Gliding movements are where the bones literally glide across each other. An example here would be like our carpals. The bones of our wrist, all those little bones that we labeled last night, how they move when you're maybe trying to put something, you know, put a tight bracelet on or something like that. They're going to kind of squish together, right, and just glide right next to each other. Angular movements in general, this is going to either increase or decrease in angle with, uh, between the bones. So something like this would be like an angular movement, right, where you're, where you're actually moving across a plane, angular movements. So looking here, these little carpal bones just kind of glide right next to each other, right? So it's considered a joint, a gliding joint. We have flexion and extension, right? Flexion is where you are, and again, it all comes back to anatomical position. In flexion, you're decreasing the angle from anatomical position. So if you start like this, flexing is decreasing that angle, right? Decreasing that angle, right? Notice how your upper extremities flex forward and your lower extremities flex posterior, right? That's gonna come into play when we learn the names of our muscles. It's gonna make a difference there. Whereas extension is the opposite. So extending is going into anatomical position, bless you. So anatomical position is in full extension. Hyperextension is going beyond anatomical position, right? Leaning backwards, pushing your palms backwards, leaning your head back, leaning your back back, all those things. That is beyond anatomical position. So this is just some pictures to help you understand um, some of those things, right? There's also uh, lateral flexion, right? So you can flex laterally just by bending side to side, right? That's lateral flexion, and only your spine can do that. Just your spine can do that. Um, you can laterally flex your head, right, with your cervical vertebrae also. So abduction. Abduction is when you're moving away from the body. So your arms and legs can abduct. Your fingers can abduct. Adduct, A-D-D, -D, you're adding them back to your body. Adduct. Abduct, you're taking them away. I'm going to abduct your children, right? Abduct. I won't abduct your children. That's not a threat. 
Um, <laughs> abduct, right? Pulling things away, adduct, you're adding them back. You can abduct and adduct your fingers and your appendages, or your arms and legs. Circumduction is unique to um, your shoulder. So circumduction is where you can actually go around the axis. Your, 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 the actual fixator, the, the joint itself stays, stays in one place, but the rest of, of that structure can go around and circumduct, right? Circumduction is where your one, point, one part stays fixed and the rest rotates around. This is abduct, adduct, circumduction, and then we have rotation. So a couple things can rotate. You can rotate your head, right? That atlas axis um, joint that we talked about last night. You can actually rotate at your shoulder. Medial lateral rotation is a little harder. Um, you can rotate at your feet. You can rotate your toes inward like this, or toes pointing outward like that rotate like that. So there's a couple different ways you can rotate. There are some special movements with certain parts of your body. Opposition is only for your thumb. All right, so your thumbs, you ever heard of that? We have opposable thumbs, that's where it comes from, because your, your thumbs can do this motion called opposition. No other finger can do that, right? Um, and depression and elevation refer to like our mandible. You can depress your mandible. You can elevate your mandible, right? Depress and elevate. You can depress and elevate at your shoulders, right? Moving up or down. So opposition, depression. There's also protraction and retraction, right? You can protract your head. <laughs> you can retract your head. Protract your mandible. Or retract your mandible. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Inversion and eversion are specifically for your feet. So uh, inversion would be where you are taking your, your feet and you're kind of turning the soles of your feet inward. So they're the soles of your feet. This, I wore flip-flops just for this. Um, just kidding. I didn't want my shoes to get wet. So your um, soles touch together. Eversion is trickier. Eversion is where you're trying to stand on the insides of your feet. doesn't work very well. Um, Protraction, retraction, there's better pictures if you didn't get to see my toes. Right? And then dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are also terms that go with your feet. So dorsiflexion is when you're pointing your toes up, like you want to hold the door closed with your foot, dorsiflex. Have you ever done that? I don't know, maybe it's just me because I want to keep my kids out. <laughs> Put my foot on the door, I dorsiflex, right? Plantar flexing is pointing my feet, pointing your toes, right? When I say point your toes, no one points their toes like that, right? <laughs> That's holding the door closed because it's dorsiflexion, right? Planting, plantar flexing is pointing your toes. So like standing on your tiptoes is plantar flexing. Ang uh, angular motions of your, of your forearm, supination, and pronation. So in anatomical position, your arms are in a supine position, right? Your, your palms are up. If you were to pronate, you're rotating your forearms posterior, right? Pronate posterior. Or you can think of it like this. You eat your soup supinated, or you eat your supper. I don't call it, does anyone call it supper? I just call it dinner. It's, some people call it supper. You eat your supper supinated, right? That's palms up and open. Pronation is backwards. Um, we did those already. Okay, so as we mentioned, range of motion is um, related to that stability and movability piece. Um, some of our joints, like our knee, right, have less range of motion, like our knee is just a simple hinge joint, right, just back and forth. doesn't really have any lateral motion to it. Um, so we'll talk about some of, some of these types of joints. We mentioned gliding joints already, plane joints. These are very simple. This is just where those joints just glide right next to each other. So another example of a gliding joint. Whoops. Hinge joints. Hinge joints, again, this is all about the articulating surface. Hinge joints have 
one piece that rotates around another, just like the hinge of a door, right? One bone kind of interacts or rotates around another at a hinge joint. So your elbow and your knee are examples of hinge joints. Pivot joints allow for rotation. So that C1, C2 atlas axis articulation is an example here of a pivot joint allowing for rotation around one another. A condylar joint, th these would be like our um, carpal and phalange joints, so, um, or our metacarpal phalange joints. Where our phalanges, where the proximal phalanges meet up with our metacarpals, the way those articulating surfaces meet up, it allows for this kind of mortal and pestle shaped um, structure, where one just kind of gliding over the surface of the other. All right, your thumbs do that too. A saddle joint is specific to, to your thumb. Um, so the, the saddle joint is specific to where that first metacarpal meets up with the trapezium carpal. They fit together like a saddle and a rider. So, and they do that to allow that special movement of opposition. It's the only place where that happens, and it's because of that saddle joint allowing that to happen, those articulating surfaces fitting together like that. Ball and socket joints, this is how our appendages are held onto our body. So we have a ball and socket at our hips, we also have a ball and socket at our shoulders. So there's, there would be a shallow cup and then a ball fitting into that cup to make that ball and socket. So this chart here, so we get directly from your book, has all of the, just a good summary of all of the different joints, how they're classified, how they move, right? Going through the fibrous joints, classifying them, showing you a picture, right? Telling you how they're functionally put together, antiarthrotic or synarthrotic, right? And then there's also a continuity of movability, right? So, um, let's go through some of our specific joints. So at our elbow, it's a very stable hinge joint. It's very stable because the ulna, right, and our humerus lock together. You saw that last night, how that ulna literally hooks on to the humerus and rotates around that trochlea. But there's actually two joints here, right? You have the humeral ulnar joint, right, between the humerus and the ulna, and there's a humeral radial joint between the radius and the humerus, right? Your two forearm bones are interacting with your upper arm bone. There's three ligaments involved here. So one's called the radial collateral ligament. Anytime you see the word collateral, collateral means that it's going around something. So the radial collateral ligament goes around the radius. Your ulnar collateral ligament goes around the ulna. The annular ligament, it goes around the annular. No, there's nothing called an annular. The annular ligament wraps around the entire structure. Right, so it's, it's like the saran wrap holding the entire elbow together. And so here you see those structures. The ligament around the ulna, the ligament around the radius, and then the annular ligament that wraps around the whole thing. Just like all of our synovial joints, there's a joint capsule, right? Synovial fluid, synovial membrane, all of those structures. There's no bursa here, right? There's no other supporting structures, it's just those pieces. Our knee gets a little more complex. So our knee is a complex hinge joint. Our elbow is a simple hinge joint. Our knee is a little bit more complex because it supports the entire weight of our body, right? And so here we have, did I skip one? No. So here we have a patellar ligament. So the patellar ligament is basically a continuation of the quadriceps tendon. So you all probably know from like high school gym class, right, that the big thigh muscle in the front is called your quadriceps muscle, right? Remember, tendons connect muscle to bone. So the tendon from that quadriceps muscle comes down and it attaches to your patella and it passes right over top of your patella and it continues on. But now since it's connecting the patellar bone, the patella, to your tibia, it's called the patellar ligament because it's connecting bone to bone. So it's a continuation 
of that structure. You'll see it in a, in a minute. And then there's two joints. You have the joint between the tibia and the femur and the joint between the patella and the femur. So there's two joints happening at your knee. Other structures in there. They're not, we're not going to add them to our chart because these are specific to the knee joint. No other joint in the body has a meniscus. There's a medial and a lateral meniscus. The meniscus sit on top of the tibia. I'm not even going to attempt to draw it. It's pretty complex, but we have some really good models in lab that have all of these exact structures, and the pictures do a good job. But if you imagine your tibia, which is this big, it, to me it looks like a torch. I'll show it to you next week when we look at it in lab. It looks like a torch. On top of the tibia is this nice flat surface. It literally is like a table on the top of the tibia. Well, okay, I said I'm not going to draw, but I can't do this without, talk, without drawing it. Here we go. So here's our tibia. Here's the top of our tibia. Our femur comes down and actually has two rounded knobs on the end of it. The meniscus are little saucers. If you imagine that our femur is like these are two teacups, follow me here, they're going to sit into saucers that are right on top of the tibia. So those meniscus are there to make sure that the femur is lined up properly. What happens if you have a teacup and it doesn't fit properly in the saucer? It kind of tips over and it's wobbly, right? It's not going to be stable. Same thing. Is that right? Meniscal tears in both knees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's painful thing. Yeah, yeah. It's very painful because it makes it hard to walk. You, you you use your knees all the time. So the meniscus are sitting on these surfaces right here, allowing for the proper alignment of the femur and the tibia. So if you have a tear there, it's like bone hit and bone. It it's could great. be bone hit and bone exactly, and that's going to mess up all the other ligaments that are in there holding everything in place, right? So you also have some other ligaments in there. You have collateral ligaments. Collateral means to the side, right, or around. So you have a collateral ligament, the uh, medial collateral ligament. This one is, let's say this is medial, and this is lateral. That looks about right. So your collateral ligaments, these are going to be ligaments that just go on the sides. So this is your tibial collateral ligament. You can also call it the medial collateral ligament. Your tibia is medial. So, there's what I'm talking about, right? So this is this. You have an actual cartoony picture and then a cadaver picture, so you can see what it really looks like. Let's start with a cartoony picture first. You see those condyles of the femur, the distal condyles of the femur. Again, picture them like little teacups that need to fit into the saucers, right? The meniscus at the top of the tibia. There's collateral ligaments on the side. Here's your medial collateral ligament. You also have a lateral collateral ligament. We didn't draw that over there yet. Your patella in this image is pulled down so that you can see all of this stuff. Normally, the, the patella would sit right there on top of all of that, covering it all up, right? So in this image here, the patella would be right about there, right? The quadriceps muscles here forms this tendon. This tendon passes over the tibia, forms the patellar ligament, which continues on and attaches to other muscles, right? So there's, there will be another ligament over here, this lateral collateral ligament or fibular collateral ligament. Because in your lower leg, as you'll see, there's another bone. We have a fibula here. But notice the fibula does not interact at all at your knee joint. Right? It's just your tibia and your femur, your patella and your femur. The patella doesn't really even interact with the tibia. It's just connected by that little ligament. If you take a look here, you can see those meniscus, those little pads. They're fibrocartilage pads is what they are. They're kind of like the intervertebral disc. It's made of the same stuff. Oh, there it is. This is a nice side view for you, right? So you can see in there, take a look, articulating surfaces, 
You can see that meniscus, that's this extra little gray piece sitting on top, right? See all that fat in there? Fat's needed at your joints to help cushion, right? Acts as a shock absorber, just like the synovial fluid. You see that quadriceps tendon turning into the patellar ligament. So, knee injuries, obviously, um, can be very detrimental, right? So there's lots of supporting structures in there. We haven't even talked about the cruciate ligaments yet. Um, but the cruciate ligaments um, also help hold this thing together. So we have these two ligaments on the sides, right? There's some other uh, ligaments in there that we'll talk about. The fibular collateral and posterior collateral ligaments, they're all in there to hold it together. You also have a popliteal ligament on the back of the knee, right? So there's actually six major ligaments in your knee, right? But knee injuries are pretty common because your knee, <laughs> I didn't do it. Your knee is literally designed to just do this, right? So what happens when you're an athlete or a clumsy person like me, and you happen to somehow move your knee <laughs> like this? You get hit from the side, right? And all of a sudden, your, your femur's popping this way, but your tibia's going that way, right? Or vice versa, right? That's when you're going to rip and tear your ligaments or rip and tear your meniscus. The two ligaments that are in there that help prevent that alignment are called your anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament, your ACL and PCL. Right? Cruciate literally means cross. These are ligaments that literally cross over each other. One crosses over like this, and one crosses over like that. You'll see them in lab on our models, but they're literally meant to also tether your femur in place so that it doesn't wobble one way or the other to help keep everything nice and aligned, right? This is why it's such a common sports injury for those high contact sports. Basketball, we have to be super agile, or um, football, or you're going to, you know, pump them from the sides. So, that's showing you those, those cruciate ligaments in there crossing over their interior, they're encapsulated, they're within the joint capsule. So usually surgery is needed to fix these things, right? Lots of um, physical therapy, um, strength training to get your muscles back up in order because if your quadriceps muscles and your hamstrings muscles, right, your thigh muscles, if your thigh muscles aren't developed enough, right, then they're not going to be strong enough to support a stable knee joint. You have to have strong, stable muscles in order for your knee joint to work properly. So, goes back to if you're not exercising, take care of yourself, you're more prone to those types of injuries, right? So, your shoulder joint, again, more unstable because it's very, very mobile, right? Your shoulder joint um, is a ball and socket joint, as we've said already. It has something called a labrum. So imagine that scapula, right? The glenoid cavity of the scapula. It's basically formed from the acromion and the coracoid process, right? And then there's just this little opening there. And somehow the humerus just kind of sits right in there. Well, the labrum is like an extra glove that fits in that area. Imagine a catcher's mitt. Have you seen the catcher's mitt of somebody that plays baseball? Mm -hmm. How does a catcher's mitt compare like the, the first baseman's glove? It's deeper. It's deeper and bigger, right? That's what the labrum is. It's deeper and bigger to help hold the humoral head, to actually give it something to grab onto. Because otherwise, that glenoid cavity is really shallow and it's like nothing, right? It's just a little surface and then two processes. So the labrum is there to give that humoral head something to grab onto. It deepens and widens the socket, right? It deepens and widens the socket or the ball and socket joint. And it's called the glenoid labrum because it's called the glenoid cavity. And so it's made of fibrocartilage, um, but that's what it's doing. It's there to increase the depth and the width of that cavity. There's a couple tendons in the area. You have the biceps brachii tendon in the shoulder, right? Um, and there's tendons of the other muscles that we call the rotator cuff muscles. So these muscles we're going to learn about in the next chapter and in lab. But your rotator cuff is made of these four muscles. One's called the supraspinatus. That's on the supraspinat, the, the supraspinous fossa, right? One's called the infraspinatus. That's on the infraspinous fossa. Remember, we saw all these things last night. One's called the subscapularis. That's on the subscapular fossa. 
right? And one's called the teres minor. That's another little muscle in there. Um, I think of it as the, the bra strap muscle because it's that muscle that, well, it's not a muscle on me anymore, but it's that little piece that kind of hangs over in the back. That, or it shouldn't really hang over, but it's your teres minor. You also have a teres major in there, but the major is not part of the rotator cuff. So these are all muscles that help you do this. Right? And so those help stabilize and hold your humerus into place. Because otherwise, it's just hanging out in there, right? It's not really doing much. So here it is, right? Looking at it more carefully, you see some bursa in there. Those purple things are bursa, right? Anywhere where the ligaments or tendons or bones and tendons are going to rub onto each other, they're there protecting. You have, and so this is where understanding the names of the bones will help you, right? So a multiple choice question might be, uh, which of the following ligaments is not part of the shoulder joint, right? And so I might list the coracohumoral ligament. You might not be able to point to the coracohumoral ligament on a diagram, but knowing the word corico from coracoid process and humoral from humerus, you should be able to deduce that that's part of the shoulder, right? So uh, the, the question might say corcohumoral, glenohumoral. Um, where's the other one? Uh, there's a corcoclavicular, right? Uh, and uh, annular ligament. Right? Annular ligament's on the elbow. All the other ones are all named after processes and things up here on the shoulder. Right? No diagrams in here. Um, if there was a diagram, I would let you know. I would say, this diagram will be on your exam. But that's not the case. It's just multiple choice style type questions. Um, for now. So, um, other things you see these big muscles coming in off of the scapula, they're going to wrap over and attach to the humerus and hold the humerus in place, right? Those tendons are going to hold that humerus in place. Here you see another view that capsule. You can really see the labrum here, this dark blue structure that's under there. It's right on that bone. That's part of the labrum, it's part of the articular cartilage. It extends beyond. Right, you see it here, kind of extending beyond the bone, deepening that socket there. And then all of the muscles attaching directly to the humerus. Oops. There's another picture. This is an interior view, right? So you took the humerus out and look in, set a nice deep pocket, even by the labrum. So shoulder dislocations are pretty common, right? You, I, I, did I tell you my story of breaking my shoulder yet? I don't know if I did, but when I did it, I thought that I, I thought that I dislocated it, and I tried to jam it back in because I saw it on like, you know, all the medical shows. They're like, oh, they just like jam it back in, and uh, that was not smart. Um, so I'll tell you the full story. It, it is a pretty dramatic thing, as all bone breaks are. But anyways, so dislocated shoulders are fairly common. It's more common to dislocate your shoulder because it just kind of dangle in there, right? It's less common to break your shoulder um, because uh, the bones will, will those, those ligaments will give away before the bone break actually happens, right? It's the opposite in your hips. You're more likely to break your hip than to dislocate your hip because the bones fit together more snugly and, and we'll look at that. A separated shoulder um, is where that acromial clavicular joint, so that actual Sometimes it's my fault and sometimes it's really not my fault. Where that, that joint between your clavicle and your, and your scapula, right? Where that joint actually becomes dislodged. And that can be very painful also. So um, this is common in sports injuries, right? Usually they'll have to go in, they can manipulate it. Physical therapy, always going to have to go along with that. So. One of the biggest issues with the shoulder and mobility is that because it is your most movable joint and your least stable joint, getting it back to its full range of motion is very tricky, if not impossible, um, because of, of how all of these ligaments have to fit together, um, which is why if you've ever known someone to have had rotator cuff surgery, more than likely they're still going to complain that they have a bad shoulder. Right, even years and years after. Go ahead, Sam. My one friend has dislocated the shoulder like so many times that the other day he went to like flying a trash bag into the, like the, the dumpster at work and it just popped right out of place. Oh. Like it was just. Can he do it himself? Is it? Yeah, he can just set it back into place by himself. It's just a routine problem, which is really bad. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, they can pop back into place. And, and what's probably happened is all those ligaments that are nice and tight on most of us have just kind of stretched out so much on him. It's kind of like, you know, just, all right, got to stick it back in there. And he's probably just, he's getting that humoral head back into the labrum, kind of resetting it like that. And his nerves are shot too, like. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> so he can't feel anything or he doesn't have control? I, I genuinely don't know. I just remember he messed it really bad during the football season, and then since then he said he's dislocated like at least double digits and stuff. Uh, yuck, yuck, yuck. So, yeah. I mean, the good thing is, is you can learn to set it yourself, and it's not like he has to go to the PR every time. Um, let's talk about the hip. So the hip joint, sometimes it's called the coxal joint, C-O-X-A-L, um, because your hip bones are technically called your coxal bones. So here we have a labrum also. Except instead of being called the glenoid labrum, it's called the acetabular labrum. Because that cavity where the femoral head fits is called the acetabulum. So you have the acetabular labrum, again, catcher's mitt in that cavity, making it wider and deeper so the femoral head can fit in there. And there's something called retinacular fibers. So these are extra fibers that surround the head of the femur, making it nice and strong, building that nice strong attachment. Again, why it's more likely to break your hip than to dislocate it because there's all of these reinforcing things there. It's much stronger, much bigger joint. So our major ligaments here, and again, these words probably look a little more foreign to you because we haven't learned them in lab yet. Is iliofemoral, ischiofemoral, pubofemoral. You see that word femoral, that's telling you femur, right? So you should think hip. Eventually, next week, you'll know the ischium, the ilium, the pubis, right? But for now, those might look a little foreign. And then there's also a, a ligament that comes straight from the head of the femur, all connecting the femur into that acetabulum. Right. So here it is from a nice um, front anterior view section here, so you can see that labrum, that wide and deep in cavity, some of the ligaments in there. And again, look at how much tighter these ligaments are wrapped around this joint as opposed to our shoulder joint. Right? Our shoulder joint had a, had a lot of space in there. There was a lot of bone in that picture. Here, you can't even see the head of the, humor, uh, the, head of the femur sitting in that joint because it's so covered in ligaments. Right? And, and it makes sense. It's more If we walked around on our hands, well, yeah, then, then you know, this joint would be a lot more stable. But we don't walk around on our hands, so this, this joint has to be more stable. This is looking into that hip bone where that labrum is. The cadaver shot is always really cool too to see what it actually looks like. How smooth, look how smooth the head of the femur is, right? It's just like glass, super smooth. Oops, wrong way. So, hip replacements um, are common because of osteoporosis, um, wearing away the head of the femur, repetitive breaks, um, as well as osteoarthritis, right? Osteoarthritis, that we are in tear of that joint cavity. Um, and so severe, osteoarth uh, severe arthritis, trauma, car accidents, fractures, things like that can lead to hip replacements, um, bone tumors also. So in a hip replacement, there's a couple of things that might um, be replaced. This is the PowerPoint going to it, yeah. So there is a replacement of the total joint, which would be where they're replacing the acetabulum itself, the socket and the head of the femur. That's a total hip replacement, right? You're replacing the entire joint. And in doing that, that femoral head replacement usually includes a metal rod that's gonna go down the femur <coughs> for increased stability, right? Um, a partial replacement would be either or. It might be just the femoral head or it might be just the acetabulum. It depends on where the, the damage has occurred, right? So it might just be this or it might just be that. Um, but the total total replacement would be both. Um, and things that go into deciding that would be like how old the person is, right? Um, people that are young, like 20s and 30s, having hip replacements at that age, these hip replacements are only designed to really last and be in your body for like 15 or 20 years. So you're going to need another one, and maybe even another one. Kind of like my, my friend's husband who needed to continually have that femur replaced, right? You're, when you have these types of foreign things in your body, they're not meant to be there for 80 years, right? They're really only meant to be there for the last 10 or 15 years of your life. So getting replacements, parts of your body replaced at young age is tricky. Um, when I was training for my first marathon, I was 20, 
four, um, and I came down with some knee issues, and they told me never to run again, and that I had the knees of an 85-year-old, and that I was going to need a, a knee replacement, but I was only 24 years old, um, and they weren't willing, thank goodness, I didn't go that route, but they weren't willing to even pursue that, because they said, you'll need like three more in your lifetime if you get one now, because you need one every, you know, 15 or 20 years, so I took some years off, and I was able to run a couple of marathons since then, but anyways, so... Uh, joint replacement requires lots and lots of rehab because it's such a movable, important joint. Um, your hip joint, obviously, it supports your whole body. This is how we move. This is how we get around. And so there's lots of physical therapy that takes place for that. Dang, I didn't realize we finished. Um, oh, dude, we might finish today. Anyways, that's joints. Um, so in terms of it, knowing the ligaments, it's just the specific ligaments that were mentioned in the PowerPoint. Not all of the ligaments that are in the pictures you need to know. Just like the bolded ones right there right there. Um, and no diagrams, just multiple choice style for now. Can I ask a couple questions? Sure, sure. Um, uh, these things, what are they that are underlined? So those are just the names of the bones. 